Hello all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're listening to this podcast, and welcome to episode nine of the Goddess Project, which is on Medusa, Medusa Misunderstood. And this is one of my favorite topics. I've got my mic back, anyways, for those of you <clears throat> who have been following along, um, and so hopefully you can hear me better, um, and there won't be so much crackling. Uh, the last podcast. There was some crackling and I was like, so annoyed. Um, So welcome to the Goddess Project podcast. For those of you that are new, my name is Dr. Carla Ionescu and my PhD and my research studies is on the Goddess Artemis. That is my area of expertise. The Goddess Project podcast uh, was started just recently. This is our first season. And it is really a space where um, it's just an informal conversation about goddesses, symbols. We've done symbols, monsters. We're going to do all these, um, all the things that I like to talk about that I actually feel like I don't have enough time to talk about in my classes. Um, I teach at the universities, uh, at one university here in Toronto and a couple of colleges. Um So if you want to find out more about me or if you want to purchase my book, I just published a book on the goddess Artemis, uh, the Greek goddess Artemis, because there's a lot more to say about her. It's called She Who Hunts. You can find it anywhere, Amazon, Indigo, if you're in Canada, um, where I cover a lot of what I think has been missed about the goddess Artemis. And um, it's sort of a beginning or an introductory nonfiction book on the rituals and the practices that were overlooked uh, by classicist scholars is what I mean. And actually that ties into today because today we're going to talk a little bit about um, Artemis as well, just a little bit because I got to stick her in every time. And, but I also find these connections with her, which are really exciting, but we're actually, what we're going to really talk about is uh, Medusa. You know, so I don't, I don't, if you're listening to this podcast on Spotify, I'm holding up a little statue. If you're on my Instagram, you could go see it. I've got the statue. It's pretty like touristy statue of Medusa. I got it when I was in Greece the very first time. Um, and actually, I put it in my uh, travel bag coming through customs. And every single time I stopped in London and I stopped in Frankfurt um, on my way home back to Canada, and every single time she beeped, every single time they made me open the suitcase um, and they looked at her like, oh, what is this thing that you have in your um, suitcase? Which was really weird because it's just a little silver statue uh, with what looks like a little marble base. Um, so when I was in Greece, the first time I picked that up, I've always been fascinated with Medusa. My favorite thing, though, is this is the necklace that I wear. Um, if you can see it, um, it's really just her head. Um, surrounded on on sort of a a medallion and it's surrounded by um, I don't know some kind of platinum circle Um, and I've purchased this actually the last time I was in Crete or the last couple of times I was in Crete I can't remember Um, and it was just meant to be because this jeweler had only one left and I thought it it was going to be a bit too large Um, I don't really wear a lot of jewelry So, but I really wanted a Medusa to wear around my neck as a form of protection because we are going to talk about all the ways in which she protects women and people and anyone that honors her. And so I've been wearing that really happily. I have not been able to find that. I would love to give that as a gift to people, but I have not been able to find it. I'd have to go back probably and walk around Crete uh, and see if I can find other jewelry shops that will have the head of Medusa. And I want it to be a head that is, I want it to be a symbol that is not scary or violent or, you know, cause there are some art of Medusa that you can purchase, but it's typically threatening. And I wanted it to be something that's not threatening and perhaps not even that clear of what it is that I, that I would have. So So without further ado, um, let's get to uh, Medusa and let me share my screen with you guys. This feels a bit like class. Let me share my screen with you guys. And if you are not, uh, if you're listening to me, that's okay. I'm going to describe everything that we're going to be talking about. 
So you don't have to worry. We don't have, you don't have to watch it on YouTube if you are just listening to it. Yeah. Okay. So let's begin at the beginning. I'm, be- I'm, I'm starting with uh, one of the pediments uh, on, at the Temple of Arf- Ugh, Artemis in Corfu. Uh, because it is the one of the earliest depictions of a gorgon. Okay, so some people refer to this as Medusa, although it is unclear whether or not this is Medusa or another gorgon. So we're going to talk a little bit about if there's a difference between the two and how the two have become one. So I like to refer to this as Medusa because I think it's the most easiest to discuss, but also because the snakes are already in her hair and so she's really kind of, st- she's doing that um, walking pose or stepping over pose. So if you've ever seen ancient Greek art, especially that's about uh, 2,500 years old or almost 3,000 years old, there is this pose in which divinity sort of step over. It looks like they're stepping over. Their hands are kind of spread out sideways and their feet are, looks like they're taking a wide step sideways. And this has a lot to do. There's been some debate about whether or not this represents taking a step across the earth, walking. Uh, It's this movement of, to me, it's a movement of straddling or, yeah, straddling or stepping over both worlds. And so that the divine um, in these art, in these pieces of art, have this control between the divine world and then the human world. But there's a lot of debate about this and it's, uh, it's really uncertain on the reason of why some of these paintings are done or art is done like this. Either way, my favorite, my favorite thing about this pediment and this sculpture. So this sat right outside of Artemis's temple in Corfu, right at the top um, on top of the columns. And this picture of the Gorgon Medusa or the sculpture, sorry, of the Gorgon Medusa was central. What you can see here is that she has the snakes wrapped around her waist In that two snake embrace that we talked about in the last podcast, so that duality, that twin snake, that symbol of wisdom, of knowledge, and particularly of healing. And you could see the snakes that are coming out of her hair. And you could see a little bit behind her, almost like a scaling on the wall. Okay, And there is what looks like on the side here, either a serpent-faced lion or sphinx. It's unclear what that is. And there's a couple of other bodies around her. It's one of my favorite images because it is non-threatening, even though she has that Gorgon smile sort of with the teeth and the eyes are big. To me, it appears to be non-threatening. And unless, unless you think of threatening as sort of a protective warning face. So perhaps there's a bit of threat in it, but it's not... It's non-threatening in the way that we think about Medusa in the modern world, I think. So I'd like to start with this image of her. The second image that's also quite ancient is, again, from the mid-century, uh, mid-6th century uh, BCE. And it's another marble statue of the Gorgon. Not as clear whether or not this is Medusa as well. But again, Medusa comes out of that tradition. The two are very embedded in each other. It is, uh, it is difficult to tell actually who came first. Although I think classicists lean towards the Gorgon tradition comes first. And Medusa is a later adaptation by the Greeks. So there are some recent studies that show that Medusa as a divine character with the snaked hair may also have some Northern African um, origins where the snaked hair may represent dreadlocks. And in fact, when you look at early Gorgon depictions, the hair is very much in this, it looks like braided dreadlocks. And so remember that pre-Greek, in pre-Greek times, The depiction of gods as fearsome, and actually even during Greek times, the depiction of gods as fearsome is is an element of protection. That is, when people wore masks, for example, at celebrations of Dionysus and other celebrations, the masks could be fearsome. But the point of that was that that was a form of protection for the wearer. 
And so whenever we see fearsome, I think, depictions of the ancient world today, we think, oh, monster. But it's fascinating how we don't connect the idea of monster and protection, as in that which is monstrous or scary may protect you from a real from the real threat. Or that which is monstrous or scary takes on the responsibility of protection for you or for the worshipers. And so I think that a lot of that has been misunderstood, particularly, and this may be a little rant, but particularly since the true monsters in our society are those who look like us. Yeah. So, you know, when you think about the, for example, today, the devastating mass shooting that took place in the United States, the monster, which is this young man, looks like everyone else. And if you think about even serial killers or, you know, others who committed heinous crimes, they look like everyone else. And so the monster is not visible. And yet in our imagination and in historical depiction, we associate whatever is fearsome in the face or body with monstrosity, which in a way is a contradiction, right? Because the very things we should fear are us <laughs> or look the people who look like us. And the very thing that in our imagination we fear are beings that look frightening or abnormal or unnatural. And I find that fascinating. Uh, and I'm sure psychologists find that fascinating, of course. And even in our horror movies and supernatural movies, we're always afraid of these boogeymen, right? These monsters in the dark. Uh, and yet the people we should fear are actually everyday looking people. So one of the things about Medusa to me personally, um, and, and I think this is part of my, I'm, I'm working on a new book, some of you might know, on sort of descending into darkness. One of the things I think that we have to do in a way, particularly as women, uh, but men too, is embrace the darkness as not something evil. So when I say to you, embrace the darkness, you go, oh, should I embrace my dark side? No, not the assumption is that the dark side is something evil, right? It's very Star Wars. Oh, go to the dark side or don't go to the dark side. But in fact, I think in the darkness, originally, remember we talked about in the womb, in the cave, in even in the underworld, which is sort of the supernatural space, in these spaces of darkness, we felt at home. We felt safe. We were safe. So it is only within modernity that we began, especially as women, but also men, um, to be afraid of the dark because we can't go out in the dark, right? Uh, but what do we fear? We don't fear the monsters as in Medusa or the Hydra or we don't even fear animals, really. What we fear is men, other men. And, and that, doesn't mean, that, that doesn't matter for women or men. When we go out into the dark, let's say, or walking down a lonely street or whatever, as females, yes, we fear men. But other men also fear men. And so the thing that we fear is our own species. The thing that we fear is our own people in our community that look like us, that in fact don't look frightening at all. Because if a guy walks up to you and he looks super scary, your first reaction is going to be run or fight. And But if a guy walks up to you and he looks very average, you're not going to be afraid and that's when you get caught. Okay. So sorry about my rant there, but I'm just, you know, I just want you to connect this idea of monsters and the way that we have been indoctrinated, the conditioning that we've had is to react to monsters when they look scary. Their vi the visage is scary. And I think that that undermines our fight or flight response, our instinct response, where something in our gut says, this guy is not good. But because he looks normal, I say that in quotes, we override our instinct. But if this guy, in quotes, looked like Medusa or a scary monster or even a clown, for those of you who are afraid of clowns or whatever, your first react, you would listen to that first reaction. You see what I'm saying? It's pretty incredible, actually, when you think about the conditioning 
that we've received and the almost this belief like even when for example something happens like the tragedy in Texas right now there's a disbelief when you're looking at this young man because he looks normal i say that in quotations um so there's a our minds are on disbelief we're like no this can't something must be wrong with this guy well something is wrong with him but our minds because we've been conditioned to think of monsters in this way as a gorgon or others our minds almost for a second go no this can't be right yeah so i just want you to think about the depth of that you know i don't want to be here forever <laughs> going over it but i just want you to think about the depth how deep that goes that we always that we almost always overcome our instinctual reaction because our eyes and our conditioning see what we want to see and back to this Gorgon of the 6th century BCE, this is a standing statue for those of you that are not watching. A standing statue. The face is, again, the Gorgon face with a wide mouth. The hair is not necessarily snaked, but again, looks kind of like braids or dreadlocks. She has a snake, a um, geese, or uh, looks like sort of one uh, a body covering, let's say. And the two snakes wrapped around as a belt and she's holding on to one of them. And so, again, it's actually quite a very beautiful statue, to be honest, the sculpture. But another early depiction of uh, the Gorgon as monster. So the Gorgons themselves were said to have the three, Medusa and her two sisters, were said to have um, three names. So Uriali, for example, is the wide stepping. And so that's why sometimes... When you look at Gorgon sculptures in the ancient world, it is difficult to know exactly which one Medusa is until much later when Athena starts wearing her and um, Leonidas is wearing her and, and other people are wearing her. Then you know that that's Medusa. But in the early period, you know, there's these three Gorgon sisters. So Uriali is the first one. She's the wide stepping uh, Steno, which is the strong Right. And then Medusa, whose name actually translates into guardian or queen. So, even her name is about protection, but all of them, all three sisters have names of strength because again, like I said, wide stepping also is this idea of taking up space. So Uriali, of course, takes up space and this concept of, of, and the wide stepping also has a lot to do with earthquaking and making the ground shake because of that power. And of course, uh, Steno, which is um, strength and strong. So the, again, this depiction. And then Medusa as guardian or queen. It is not an accident that her name is guardian or queen. Um, we've just forgotten it. Yeah? And so there's a few more figures that I'm showing you. This is a red figure of Medusa or a Gorgon Medusa. Um, again, 5th century BCE. She, again, is wide-stepping. In her hair, there is snake. She's got the wide mouth with the, with the tongue and teeth coming out. And this time, she has wings. So we've talked a little bit about wings in the past, especially around Artemis. Oh, and I didn't connect the fact that Medusa, the guardian queen at Corfu, that first image that I showed you, is on the temple of Artemis. So there's this connection. There's this ancient connection between Artemis and Medusa as protectress, particularly of wild women, particularly of that wilderness that is within, and particularly of embracing the darkness, embracing power. Okay? So to me, Medusa has always represented embracing women's power around anger, around rage, around ugliness, that there is power in being self-sufficient and in being independent. And Medusa certainly is an independent divinity. Um, and so this is one of her powers. So let's talk a little bit about her myth. Now, there's a couple of takes on the myth. I'm going to give you a few. I'm going to actually give you two from uh, ancient scholars. But... There's a couple of points that I want you to remember. Number one, Medusa is assaulted or seduced by Poseidon. There's a debate of whether she's assaulted or seduced. Assaulted implies, of course, that she's raped and has no say. 
seduced, which is li- a later version, implies that she is willing, a willing partner, and may have a say. In the beginning, our earlier um, stories tell us that she was seduced in a field or out in nature in the wilderness. Later, we have a depiction that says she was seduced or raped in Athena's temple. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And from this union, later when when Medusa is killed, from her neck, from her bleeding neck, comes Pegasus, the flying horse. And so she, so Pegasus is her son because, of course, Poseidon is the god of um, horses as well as the sea. And the flying horse is the sort of magical creature that comes from this union once Medusa is dead. So we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, and birthing and, and bleeding. But the two versions of the, the two sources that I want to bring up, of course, are His- Hesiod's uh, Theogony, where he says, Poseidon, he of the dark hair, lay with one of these, Medusa, one of the Gorgons, in a soft meadow and among spring flowers. So that's what um, Hesiod tells us. Now later, so this is in 8th, 7th century BCE, around the same time that these sculptures that I've just shown you and this red figure that I've shown you took place. Later, about 500 years later, I mean, give or take, Ovid in his Metamorphoses writes, Medusa was violated in Minerva's or Athena's shrine by the Lord of the sea, Poseidon. And Zeus's daughter, Athena, turned away and covered with her shield her virgin eyes. And then, for fitting punishment, transformed the Gorgo's lovely hair to loathsome snakes. So I want you to think about how in, two, in 500 years, things shift. Um, and of course, you know, this move from um, Greek epic to Roman epic. But initially, there, Athena giving Medusa snake hair could be seen as a form of protection. And it is my argument that Poseidon sl- uh, s- sorry, assaults Medusa and that Medusa, when she prays to Athena for protection, and apparently we're told that Athena never shows up and Athena doesn't care. Athena doesn't do very much for women, especially in the later periods, Greek periods. But when we're told that she asks Athena for protection and Athena punishes, in quotation, her with snakes, the one thing that we could really look at that I don't think that people have considered, especially in classics as much, is that this is actually the protection that Medusa asked for. Because from the moment that Medusa has snake hair and can turn people to stone, she now will never, ever be assaulted again. And so she is fully protected through this snake hair. So there's two things I want you to think about based, especially on some of the podcasts that we've talked about in the past. Number one, snakes are knowledge and snakes are on her head. I mean, you can't, you can't put together a better symbol than secret knowledge or sacred knowledge. So Medusa is extremely wise. Perhaps this is also why she lives alone in a cave. And the second thing is the snakes turn anyone who comes towards her or at her into stone. And if you think about it, Medusa only turns men to stone because men are going into her cave trying to kill her, right? And so this snake power is protection power. The fact that it becomes punishment uh, later on in Ovid's Metamorphosis is a reflection not of Medusa or Athena, or that tradition, but a reflection of patriarchy and the growing, well, I would say full-fledging patriarchy of the Roman Empire, where um, the association of Athena as a virgin, literally, who can't look at an act of sex, or in this case, violation, and punishes other women fits very, very, very perfectly into uh, patriarchal propaganda that is turning women against women for an act that, in fact, Medusa has no say over because she's being assaulted. And then to add um, 
what is the saying to add something to injury? You're probably all saying it now. You probably all know it. Insult to injury. Thank you. Thank you all. Insult to injury. Um, we have a depiction later on, of course, uh, of Perseus depicting uh, the Gorgon Medusa's head. In this actually, in this image that I'm showing you here is again, mid 6th century BCE uh, from a temple in Sicily. And the sad part about this, uh, there's two parts that I like about it. The first part is that Medusa's head remains the Gorgon face. So that's really interesting as opposed to like the beautiful face that she gets later on with the snakes. But the sad part about it is, of course, that she's holding on to Pegasus, which is her son, as Perseus uh, decapitates her. And so I also want you to think about actually this idea of decapitating as the death of Medusa, because what do we hold in our head? Knowledge. What does Medusa hold in her head with snakes? Sacred knowledge. Depic decapitating her is taken away her knowledge. And in fact, taking away the knowledge of powerful, independent women. Yeah. And in that violence, this magical creature of Pegasus is born or escapes out of Medusa's neck. Okay. There are a few explanations, historically speaking, of the story of Medusa. One of them um, is an argument that the decapitation of Medusa by Perseus portrays actual events during the reign of a historical king, uh, Perseus, who reigned in about 1290 BCE, and he was the new founder of the dynasty in Mycenae. Um, so there is this, again, this idea of the hero conquering the monster, but also the idea of males conquering pre-Mycenaean, in this case, uh, goddess worship and snake worship. There is also a theory that during this time, there were numerous early female deities in North Africa, and they were also being usurped by patriarchally dominated invaders from mainland Greece. And so the beheading of Medusa means that the Hellenes overran the goddess's chief shrines, stripped her priestesses of their Gordon, Gorgon masks, and took possession of the sacred horse. Okay. And so really the killing of Medusa the decapitation of Medusa is literally the decapitation of women's sources of knowledge, of power, of self-defense, of connection within their own darkness, and in particular, their independence. Because one thing that Medusa does is she lives alone. She is on her own and she is able to defend her space. Okay, so this is fundamental in a society or a time in human history when physical prowess, physical strength, and war becomes the primary way in which you identify power. And Medusa has that. She has power because anyone who comes near her turns to stone. And the fact that a male conquers her and decapitates her is symbolic of the decapitation of female power. Moving on, I want to talk a little bit about Athena, the Athena and Medusa duality of shadow. So Demetra Gorge, George makes this really interesting point. She says, Medusa and Athena are aspects of the same goddess who emerged from Lake Tritonis in Libya. They are both associated with female wisdom, which is depicted in the serpent symbolism that surrounds them. Medusa with her serpent locks and Athena with her serpent fringed Aegeus. Medusa, as a wise crone, holds the, sac the secrets of sex, divination, magic, death, and renewal. Athena, the eternal maiden, is linked with the new moon and presides over the female qualities of courage, strength, and valor. This is from Mysteries of the Dark Moon by Demetra George. And I think it fits perfectly with what I've been saying. And that is that Medusa is the, the wise crone, the one who knows about sexuality, about darkness, about power, about empowerment. And that really for women comes with age and comes with time and almost like growing into your power. Perhaps, perhaps now that I think of it, sorry, and this just came up, perhaps because as women, 
um, we don't, men have their physical power, their, 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 their peak strength, you know, around 18, 19, that's when they're the strongest to 20, whatever, when they're strongest, when their bodies are at their strength and they reach that peak level. And so for men, their power in quotation starts early, comes early. So they embody that power early and perhaps they have more confidence, more motivation in that physical strength. And which is why for older men, especially ones that were strong during their youth, they're so difficult to age. Uh, And then you have the midlife crisis, midlife issues, particularly for men uh, trying to hold on to that power that they had for women. And again, I'm making this, this is a non-academic assumption I'm making here for women because women don't measure their power through physical prowess. We come into the peak of our lives through a development of, of both sexually, economically, uh, ser- uh, communal wise, in the sense that we're building communities, we build families, we develop ourselves. And so they say, you know, women's, for example, sexuality peaks in their 30s. But I think what they don't say is that in their 40s, and particularly premenopause and through, through menopause, women actually reach that epitome of power within. And so the reason why I bring this up is that Medusa is, is seen as that age, as that crone. And I know crones are supposed to be a bit older, but in theory, it's that maturity, that experience of life that Medusa represents. And, and in, in our case, in the modern world, I could even associate that with financial um, freedom, that women in their 40s have more financial freedom than women in their 20s. And they have, they have all the freedoms. I mean, 40s is really the age where women blossom, no matter what Hollywood tells you with that nonsense. But uh, 40 is really and 50, I'm told even better. So that's really when women blossom. And the reason they blossom is because of this ability to be independent in every possible way. Athena then remains the maiden, the sort of eternal uh, maiden. And that's not just her virginity. I know there's, I mean, we haven't talked about this, but some of you might know there's that difference between the Christian concept of virginity, which includes the hymen versus the Greek concept of virginity, which is just uh, being pious. And mm, I'm trying to think of another word other than virginal, but, you know, honorable, not honorable, that's a bad word because everyone's honorable, but just sort of maintaining that strict spirituality and autonomy over your own body, which is what Athena does. Athena maintains autonomy over her own body, but she does that by rejecting all aspects of femininity, which is why I love Artemis, because Artemis embraces aspects of her femininity and her masculinity. And so she, and she also has autonomy over her own body. In my book, I go on and talk about how anybody who looks at her or invades her space or violates her space or her or her concerts or her nymphs um, is shot, killed, shot and killed. And so Artemis also has, and she's also called the virginal maiden. Again, it's, it's, it's really about autonomy over your own body rather than, than your hymen. And so Artemis embraces that both from a female and masculine perspective where where traditionally Athena embodies that more in a masculine perspective, especially over time for the Greeks. Um, There are scholars who argue that pre-Greek times, Athena also embraced her autonomy over her own body in all all non-binary ways. But as the Greeks came to power and developed, she became more of a a masculine, uh, androgynous figure. Um, But it's really fascinating that Athena and Medusa are permanently, permanently interconnected. And one of the ways that we visually see this is that Athena is constantly wearing Medusa on her body, whether it's on her shield or on her Aegis, it's usually on her Aegis or around her neck. She is constantly wearing Medusa. And so that duality um, is very, very clear. It's fascinating also to, to mention that Medusa is beheaded and Athena is born out of Zeus's head. Why do I say this is fascinating? Because that connection that I made earlier, that the slaying of Medusa is the replacement of the matriarchal order and religion with a patriarchal power. So Perseus decapitates the power of women. What's really fascinating, and this connects a little bit to our podcast from last week, is that Athena is said to come out of Zeus's head 
again, an unnatural male birthing. Now, we all know that Athena has a mother named Matisse and that Zeus supposedly ingests her, her mother, with her in her belly so that Hera doesn't find out and blah, blah, blah. So this is the, this is the old story that gets uh, so overplayed. And it gets, actually gets so overplayed that people even forget that Athena actually had a female mother that birthed her. Because what becomes the focus of mythology is that Athena is, bang, you know, is banging her um, shield inside Zeus's body, so much so that he has to ask Hephaestus to crack his head open, and she jumps out of his head. So again, remember we talked about how in the book of Genesis, men are creating with their hands, or I don't know if I mentioned this um, in that podcast, but Yahweh is creating with his voice or his thoughts. Let there be light. Let there be flowers. Let there be water. Let th- so this is a word type of birthing, a visualization type of birthing. Not an organic birthing through the body, which is what happens in the natural world. So there is this sort of higher realm of idea. So the idea is that creating with the mind is the realm of men right? Rationality, thinking, invention, creativity is the realm of men because they do things from their minds. And so creating uh, Athena, although technically she still had to be birthed by a woman because, you know, that's logic, but creating Athena or her jumping out of his head. Yeah. Um, And in Aeschylus's play, you know, Athena says, I don't have a mother, which is bullshit because you do. But anyways, Um, So this movement that men are creating with their minds, and not only are they creating with their minds, but but Zeus creates this powerful daughter, who then, of course, becomes the um, the symbol of Athens and the symbol of wisdom and the symbol of war in particular. So and justice. Right. And so that's all created by Zeus's mind. Imagine. So we're seeing these two things happening simultaneously in one way female knowledge and power is decapitated in another way men are birthing miraculous beings from their minds okay so i just want you to think about that you know these are not accidents these are purposeful propaganda and it's not like one person or one group of men or whatever that's doing it it's it's a mood <laughs> if that's the right sort of modern term right it's it, it's a slow trend that is enjoyed, that is shared, that is retold, that then becomes a fact or a reality. Okay. So this concept of Athena and Medusa as two sides of the same coin is something that I think modern classicists are starting to look at. I mean, may, perhaps not classicists, but modern people who are interested in the story of Medusa are beginning to pay more and more attention to this story and to the connection of the artistic depiction that Athena is constantly wearing Medusa. I find that stuff fascinating because what it tells me actually is that despite the movement in patriarchy, the ingrained instinctual connection to the knowledge, the secret and sacred knowledge of women cannot be erased that it's not just women that are fascinated but men are fascinated as well humans are fascinated with the power of the mother of the darkness of the earth of the cave we are fascinated beyond our rationality and so to me what this says is the continuous representation of medusa continuously being represented on athena is something that despite like I said, the slow trend of moving towards a patriarchal power, we still could not get rid of the wise woman, the fear of death, the magic of sexual power, right? Um, and so even though we demonize Medusa as sort of this, this dark feminine, the sexualized feminine, this monstrous figure who's devouring, we cannot... Hmm, We cannot put aside our fascination with the dark mother. And there is some discussion, um, for example, a scholar named Levan 
talks about how Athena and Medusa were once the same deity that ended up being split. So there's some discussion around that, which I think is really interesting. And perhaps this is why Athena continuously wears Medusa. And I hope this is something you can notice now, because if you're ever in Athens or if you're ever anywhere where you see images or sculptures of Athena, I want you to pay attention to what she's wearing. And you will see that she is wearing an Aegis, which is sort of a frock um, that is either scaled with snake skin and then the head of Medusa, or the head of Medusa is somewhere on her body, usually like under her neck or on her chest, uh, which again is interesting for those of you who are into spirituality because that's the heart chakra, um, or sometimes at, at the sternum, right? And so no, no matter how hard the concept of Medusa as this divine feminine power was trying to be erased. The fact that Athena continuously wears her leaves us this message. And so I want to show you this image, which is my favorite image. And I think it really incorporates what I'm saying. It's the, this bronze medallion of Athena Promachus. She's wearing a helmet in the form of Medusa's head. And there's an Aegeus over her left shoulder, which is a scaled it's a scaled frock. Okay? Uh, they say this may be from Delos, 2nd century BCE. It's now at the Thessaloniki Archaeological Museum. I have not made it there to see it live, but I will. Uh, I'm going on my research trip this summer and also in the fall, I'll be in Europe. So I'm very, very excited. This is one of the places I want to stop and see. What's really fascinating to me about this image is that it's an image of Athena for those of you who are not watching, sort of, uh, it's just from chest up. It's on a it's on a big medallion. It's supposed to be a fairly large um, medallion, but on her head, so you can see her hair. But on her head, she wears kind of like a cap of Medusa's hu uh, human, beautiful human head. So it's not a gorgon head, just a, a face, almost like a face mask, like a mask of a face. And then you can see a little bit of the snakes on the side of the mask. What really fascinates me about this image is the fact that this is very, very clearly exactly what I've been talking about, which is the idea that the thinking thing, the knowledge, the sacred knowledge aspect, even of Athena, is Medusa. She's where the fact that she's wearing her on her head cannot be more symbolic. Cannot be more symbolic. It's like wearing the head of your shadow self, your darker self. And I know in, in psychological terms, that is a negative, you know, the shadow self. But I think more and more people are beginning to embrace this concept that the shadow self is not necessarily negative, that there is a lot to learn from your shadow self and master from your shadow self. And the fact that in this image, Athena is wearing that on her head, to me, is a symbol of both the duality or the binary conditions of women, you know, that... Uh, virgin whore, literally, this could be a virgin whore as Med uh, uh, Athena seen as the virgin and Medusa as the whore, um, that duality. And the concept that Athena is aware of her shadow self in this image because she's wearing that on her head. Yeah. When I first saw it, I just couldn't explain how hard it hit me. In fact, I'm not sure I'm even being, I'm not sure I'm even explaining it to you guys here uh, very well. It, it just hits me it, because sometimes, oh, sometimes symbols are not meant to be explained. Yeah. There's no words to explain symbolism sometimes. And so I feel like looking at this visually is an explanation enough in a sense, you know, I want to explain what it means to me, to you all, so that perhaps you can take a look at it and see what it means to you. But it is so visually impactful. And I think it really, and then with Athena wearing over her shoulder, so like half her body is snakeskin and half her body um, is a traditional uh, Aegeus. Again, that duality of women, right? And I'm not really a fan of Athena, to be honest with you guys. To me, she doesn't do very much for women at all and doesn't represent women very much. But in this particular image, I think that she really embodies a complete female human being, right? A complete aspect of the feminine and the masculine. She, this, I think this image could really be the yin-yang, right, uh, of Greek culture. And so you can tell I'm super fascinating with it, yeah?
to speak about just I want to speak shortly shortly about then what happens to the the image of Medusa's head the image of Medusa's head becomes a figure of protection and threat and so I have a few images here if you're listening you don't really have to uh, see them but basically the image of Medusa's head becomes a popular image to put on shields for centuries and so here is an Amazon with her shield that bears the Gordon Gorgon head. Um, we have Heracles when he fights uh, Geryon, the three-body giant. We talked about that last time. He is also holding, um, I mean, sorry, uh, Geryon is holding a shield in which the Gorgon head is uh, an image that's on the shield. So again, an image of protection, but also fighting. Leonidas, my favorite, if you go, ever go to Sparta in Greece, which I highly recommend, especially in the forests uh, where the ruins are. I would highly recommend going there because the olive trees look like a velvet blanket of green. It's so beautiful. Anyways, um, uh, in Sparta, there is a massive statue still standing. Well, not still standing. It's a modern statue of Leonidas. And he has a shield and a sword. And on the shield is the head of Medusa. Again, a sign of protection through threatening. So, you know, you're supposed to uh, when you see the shield, when you see the head on the shield, you're supposed to be afraid. And if you believe some mythology, you're supposed to be stunned, frozen, turned to stone of fear. Okay. So it's fascinating to me that they, the ancient Greeks have this monster in quotation marks killed, and then they wear her head um, on all their shields. There is also a bronze head of Medusa that is a decor decorative element uh, on one of the first ships built by Caligula in the Roman times. Again, she then becomes a symbol of protection. So this bronze head of Medusa was uh, placed at the front of the ship. And again, as a sign of protection um, against, you know, any monsters um, of the sea. One of my favorite, and I've posted this, I think I've posted this on, on my Instagram and I think the most devastating for me images of our modern world right now is this palace that was built. Okay. So um, this palace was built in the sixth century by the Byzantine emperor Justinian. Okay. And I'm trying to get the story straight. So this palace used to store fresh water. Okay, at the in, at the bottom of the palace, right? and there was a reservoir, and there was water being poured at the palace, etc. However, the, there are two columns standing even today in this reservoir that are the head and face of Medusa. You can Google them actually, and you could see them if you want to visually see them. But basically, one of them is an upside down head of Medusa with a column coming out of it. And the other one is a sideways head of Medusa with a column coming out of it. And these were submerged in water. Today, I'm told that they are, I haven't been able to see them, but they're also on my list, that they are um, lifted up out of the water. So from the images that I have here, the images that you can find online, you'll see that they're not covered in water. They're, but they are kind of green and algae-ish from the water, which is cool. The thing that really, I think, hurts me when I see this image is the fact that it looks as though someone is stomping on Medusa because the column is right on top of her head and almost as though she is purposely or forcibly submerged in the water. And some people are, some scholars have said, oh, well, these were in other places and then they were reused here as part of the reservoir. But now, because we know that Medusa was such a symbol of healing and power and protection, I wonder if these were not purposely placed here in the water as sort of a, it's a weird thing to say, but as sort of a protective of the cleanliness of the water or of the water itself. I don't know. Um, scholars seem to feel like they were, they needed some stones and they used these stones, but these are just so mm, purposely placed in such a way that it's literally, to me, visually speaking, an image of the patriarchy or the might of the Just Justinian as the emperor, the might of the empire smashing or stepping down or forcing or subjugating um, Medusa or 
women's empowerment. So I don't know. But every time I see these pictures and these images, my heart breaks a little. Okay, so let's move on to Medusa as a symbol of sex and fear. There's a couple of aspects of Medusa that I think are really fascinating, particularly that combine this mixture of sex and fear. The first one is, of course, the blood. And yes, it's just she's decapitated. There's a lot of blood, obviously. And out of that blood or out of the neck comes the birthing so of, Pe- of Pegasus. And the symbolism of this, of course, is birthing in itself and the bloodiness of birth. And of course, when we think about the bloodiness of birth, we associate again menstruation because how do women conceive? You know, they have to, uh, they have to be menstruating. And so there's all of this association with blood and fear and sexuality, particularly, of course, the fear of women's sexuality and the fear of menstrual or birthing blood. Um, And we've talked about sort of menstrual blood and the menstrual power of women. One of the things that I find fascinating that we don't talk about as much is the fear of birthing. So for example, I heard some stories and actually even when I had my own children, uh, I was afraid of this because I had heard some stories that when men see their wives or partners birthing, they are so disturbed by the image that they can no longer be intimate with their partners again, their wives or uh, uh, partners, which I found frightening. Number one, because really though, dude, and number two, because I thought, oh my God, what if this happens with my husband? Um, and so when I was giving birth to both of my children, I made him swear that he would never leave like my side by my head or by my neck, you know? Of course, my husband thought this was ridiculous. Uh, and he's like, it's not going to affect me in any way. It's natural birth. It's beautiful. It's whatever. I'm like, I don't care. I want you to stay up here uh, and don't look anywhere <laughs> just in case you never know. Uh, you know, I was also like 20 years old when I had the kids. So I was very um, worried that our intimate <laughs> life uh, would be affected by this birthing situation. Uh, it wasn't. So that was good. But just this concept, it's fascinating to me that some men are so disturbed by what they see in the birthing process because it is bloody, organic, meaty, I don't know what the word, moist. I know some of you hate that word, moist. Because it's like that, um, that this, this is frightening in some way. So the blood is frightening. The snakes, of course, we've talked about it. Uh, I've talked about it forever and I'll probably return to snakes all the time. So the snakes on the head, again, especially for men are fearsome. Now today, of course, there are many women that are afraid of snakes, but like I said, in the ancient world, snakes and women had a non-threatening, non-violent connection. So again, the snakes on the head, frightening, frightening, they're the power of the snakes on the head. And then of course, the gaze the gaze of Medusa, the fact that when she looks at you, and even, for example, I don't know if you guys have seen their most recent uh, Amazon commercial where Medusa, uh, I can't remember who she stones first. Somebody comes up to her. Ironically, it's a woman, which I found historically inaccurate. But anyways, and she's stoned, like she turns to stone and then she's like, oh, I need to get something. So she buys sunglasses off of Amazon. She puts the sunglasses on and can live her life. The reason why I bring up this commercial Number one, it's kind of cute. It's kind of fun. Uh, Medusa doesn't look particularly frightening. There's something sympathetic about her in this commercial, which is all right. Uh, But one of my favorite things about that commercial is this idea that when she looks at you, the snakes look at you. And so the gaze is powerful, so powerful that it stuns you or it turns you into stone. Uh, In this case, of course, the commercial, she can put on glasses. But historically speaking, um, now that, now that I think of it, historically speaking, uh, I don't think there's ever been any analysis of what would happen if Medusa covered her eyes. Like if she covered her eyes as she turned to you, you know, instead of Perseus looking at the reflection of his shield, if she had covered her eyes, anyways, it was relevant because why would she cover her eyes when somebody's coming into her house to attack her? So the gaze itself, the power of the female, we always talk about the male gaze because we talk about women's bodies and sexuality, but the female gaze in this case is powerful, so powerful that it stuns you. It stuns you and it kills you. And then of course, the over time, 
this connection of blood, gays, snakes becomes associated with a violence, with a monstrosity. And in, in, for example, in Freudian psychology, the concept becomes of the castrating mother, the violent sexuality um, of women who are too aggressive, sexually speaking, too demanding, sexually speaking. And so Medusa, too dominating. And so Medusa, at least in the last 500 years or so, and certainly in the last 200 years since Freud and Jung and all of these, uh, and psychology becomes this massive field, Medusa becomes a symbol of unnatural women. And part of that unnatural women is what is termed a violent sexuality, which is um, women who demand sex, women who control sex, and women who control their own bodies, and then women who control their own sexuality, and perhaps even more frighteningly, the sexuality of men. And I can't say enough how significant Medusa is as a symbol for women today, particularly, again, with what's happening in the U.S. around women's bodies and how important it must have been both in ancient times and in today to have autonomy over your body. That when someone comes to tell you what to do with your body, you can literally scare them to death or scare them into stone. And so Medusa has often become this doubleness, the, this duality, not just with Athena, like we've seen, although that plays into it a lot, at once a monster and beauty, at once disease and the cure, at once the poison and the remedy. So the, you know, the, the idea of this woman with snakes, a beautiful woman of the pig. So once, once she starts being depicted more in her human face, rather than the Gorgon face, we enter this space where we have this idea of a woman with snakes who is beautiful, who turns those who look at her into stone, and that that empowers her. So I think this is one of the reasons why Medusa has remained such a mystery, number one, why she has remained such a fascinating figure, why women today are turning more and more. I mean, I don't think, you know, I've been, you know, doing research on goddesses, particularly Greek mythology and goddesses for a decade. And in the beginning, when I first started, there wasn't as much interest in Medusa as there is today. Today, there are books, there are associations, there are everything around us that is mostly produced by women. Um, are depict, you know, Medusa is almost like the new Lilith. Um, she is the symbol of female empowerment, of beauty and danger, you know, of light and dark, that kind of thing, uh, particularly on her own, right? Uh, usually, you know, like I said in the past, there was this Athena Medusa combination, but nowadays we were leaning a lot towards Medusa. And so, what is her modern influence? Well, there's a couple of different modern influences. For example, if you ever saw that GQ UK 25th anniversary issue of Rihanna, and if you haven't, just Google Rihanna and snakes or Rihanna Medusa, where Rihanna is in her utter sexy bodiness, but on her head, she's got snakes and on her body, she's got snakes and she's kind of holding on to them. Um, so in a modern, again, our fascination with beauty and danger beauty and sexuality, right? Because those pictures of Rihanna are quite sexualized. We have Medusa on the symbol or sorry, the flag of Sicily, which was first adopted in 1282. And there you see the head of Medusa. And then there's just three legs that are going counterclockwise. So the symbol of, of Sicily on the, on the Sicilian flag, we have Medusa. Of course, one of my favorite is Versace's uh, reincarnation or incarnation of, of Medusa as his logo. This one is a little bit more alluring in the sense that her face is, of course, beautiful, that sort of typical Roman beauty. She's got her hair and she's got some snakes and she's got these wings in her hair. I find this image fascinating because, again, there's this implication, even though it's modern, this implication between the snake goddess and the divine, you know, because of the wings, right? So Versace has her as a logo in different games, particularly and in different art, but certainly in gaming, Medusa has become 
uh, one of the most, the main attraction monsters, as I would call her. And so you could see her in sort of these organically fat, half snake, half women embodiments. And we talked about snake goddesses last week. And of course, there are numerous other snake goddesses. But when you ask modern people, what is the snake goddess? Or you show them an image, for example, of a, a goddess, half snake, half woman, or or snakes on her head, always people associate that with Medusa. And so she, in gaming culture, for example, and in, in other art, she has really uh, taken up space as the leading monster that is often slayed by men, often slayed by men. There was even, I didn't know, uh, I don't know if you remember, there were these monster high dolls. My daughter used to have them when she was little. And recently I saw, although I cannot find one, I would love, love, love to have a Monster High Medusa doll. If any of you have one out there, please let me know. I cannot find one to buy. Um, But there's this Monster doll, Monster High doll Medusa. So it's just a doll with like snakes in her hair. Oh, so adorable and so cute. And my favorite thing about this is that there's nothing frightening about her and that I really hope, even though I don't, I can't find any of them out there available. I really hope that young women are playing with this doll as a symbol of power, not power, like, Oh, here's a doll of power, but a symbol of this is not frightening. This is positive in some way. I was going to say adorable because it is adorable, but positive in some way. And then there are numerous plays and theater productions. Um, there's one, for example, in uh, by put on by Eastern Michigan State University called Head Full of Snakes Exploring Medusa. Again, this has a lot to do with themes of identity, power, betrayal, gender, beauty, and truth. But most importantly, for example, for this production, the question that they are asking for their play is how is myth created and how does interpretation of that myth impact our reality? So I think this takes me full circle to the beginning of this podcast where I talked about how do we, what do we associate the word monster with? um, And how do we interpret a mythological story like the story of Medusa and her so-called punishment with the ideology of our communities. So if the ideology in our communities, for example, in my community, I would like the ideology to be Medusa received a head full of snakes because now she had sacred knowledge and because Athena wanted her to be protected so that she would never be assaulted or a victim of men again. That's my interpretation that I would like to have in my community of the myth. For many, many, many generations, though, we've had the interpretation Medusa is punished by Athena by being turned into a monster in quotation marks because she dared to let herself be assaulted by Poseidon in her temple. That's the old, old patriarchal interpretation of that myth. And so what I'm seeing, particularly with these theater productions and hopefully with these podcasts and hopefully with all these people that are taking an interest in Medusa, re-reading her stories, the versions of her stories, reinterpreting her sculptures, thinking about her name, thinking about for how long the Greeks used her as a method of protection, thinking about all of those things. I hope that we see a shift in the interpretation of this figure, this figure of, I think, women's power that was literally decapitated. And that, in a way, sadly, Athena had to carry on her chest as a memory or in memory of um, the power that was lost. So thank you so much uh, for joining my podcast today. Uh, Please follow me if you like this kind of podcast. And um, if you like talking about goddesses, and if you like thinking about goddesses in this way, um, 
I'm not actually sure what we're going to do next week. I have a few monster goddesses in mind that I'd like to go over and I haven't put them in order and I'm not exactly sure. I have a book launch happening on June 2nd at York University, which I'm very, very excited about to, uh, I'm going to do a, a book signing. We're going to do a little lecture and we're going to do maybe even play a little, uh, what's your goddess quiz. I'm going to go live on Instagram. So if you want to follow me on Instagram, my Instagram is uh, Artemis Expert. But I'm going to also hope <laughs> that whoever is manning the live will hit the save button so I can save that video and then maybe put parts of it or highlights of it on YouTube for those of you who follow me on YouTube as well and on my pa Patreon uh, if you'd like to sign up for my Patreon. So I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do next week as far as a podcast, but it's going to be um, another female monster that is misunderstood. But I thought we'd start with Medusa because she's the epitome uh, of a monster misunderstood. So thank you so much for joining me. And I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Please like, subscribe, follow, share, and uh, I'll see you guys again next week. Have a great week, everyone. Goodbye.